clear out. Okay, everyone, we're going to start the next panel discussion. This one is about the subject of politics. <laughs> and uh, we have now, our, we're involved in a political season um, that I guess you can s sort of insert an adjective to what it is. I'm not sure uh, what we'd call it. But we have here some fine young uh, people who are graduates of this school who are in the thickets of covering, covering the campaign. And we're going to discuss some things in detail, and we're going to try not to be dominated by Donald Trump's late night tweets, and to talk about more substantial issues, if there are any. Um, I'm Lonnie Isabel. I'm on the faculty here at the J School. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to our panel. Um, on my left, extreme left, is Jay Newton Small, class of 01, who is Washington correspondent for Time and author of a book called Broad Influence, How Women Are Changing the Way America Works. Uh, right to my left here is uh, Daniel Bush, uh, class of 13, who is a political, politics, excuse me, producer for PBS. And uh, to my immediate right, Ashley Sumler, class of 11, is a producer at BBC World News. And to the far right, Art Swift, who is managing editor of Gallup.com. So let's get right into it. Um, my feeling about politics and about the presidential campaigns is that it is one of the most amazing uh, pop culture extravaganzas that you can imagine. It's, it's something where almost everything about America comes forth and almost every kind of discussion. It's something in which people who don't speak to each other uh, for years get a chance to speak about the same issues. And it's a chance to really look deeply into where this country is and how the state of our democracy. So I wanted to ask several questions to our panel. Uh, first one, I'd like to ask Art. And um, so the name of our panel is uh, Anomaly or uh, Political Realignment. So Dan is, uh, is a leader of the, probably the foremost political polling organization, I guess, or polling organization, most well known certainly in the, in the country or world. And so I'd like to ask him, uh, from what you've seen and from your data, is this such a different kind of a, a, a race? Is this an anomaly? Is this something that we've never seen before? Is this something that um, we may never see again? I don't think it's something we've never seen before. I think there have been a few precedents in history that would suffice to say that this is not completely original. I mean, you look at the 1948 race, for example, which was chaos going into the convention then with Harry Truman, who was by no means uh, assured of even being renominated, even though he was the sitting president of the United States, and a fierce fight going on on the right, uh, on the Republican Party with Taft and Thomas Dewey, Bob Taft, who was the son of the president, How William Howard Taft, and, and there were floor fights and backstabbing and you know a, a truly brokered convention, a contested convention, whatever you wanted to say. Uh, that was the kind of chaos that's happening now on a grander scale. 1920 was even worse on the Republican side, where I believe it was the 87th or 88th ballot that Warren Harding, who was kind of at the bottom in delegates, just continued to rise every time there was voting. So, and then he eventually won the nomination. He eventually became president, short-lived president, but he became one. So the point is, even in 1976, we see parallels to to now with Gerald Ford and uh, Ronald Reagan. And I, I'm starting to feel like the 76 example is gonna be potentially the most likely to happen this time on the Republican side, where Gerald Ford just came shy of the required amount of delegates and then through deal making and through people coming 
to his side between the end of the primaries and the beginning of the convention, he basically sealed the nomination. There's a lot of possibility that that would happen with Donald Trump this time. Uh, so the, this is a long answer to your question that this, I do not think, is an anomaly. But it sure seems pretty weird, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> to say the least. And so, Ashley, you are working for uh, BBC, which uh, I'm often amused when my foreign friends call and they say things like, what the H is going on there in the United States? Or this is beginning to look like a French election, or things like that. <laughs> um, how does this, is this election playing worldwide? I think that people are really interested in the election worldwide in a way that they aren't every time. And I think it is this kind of like circus element to it almost. I've talked to a lot of colleagues in London and um, around the world who say that the number, the two things that people don't understand about America right now are the gun culture and the Donald Trump phenomenon. That's what they get asked about the most. So I think that people are, usually at this point, people are tired of the American election, I think, because it's just such a long campaign. Mm -hmm. But um, and it goes on for months and years, and that's another thing that they don't understand. But this year, it's consistently one of the top things that people are tuning into us for and um, clicking on our website, and people seem really engaged this year in this campaign. Well, it's great reality TV. Um, in a way. Uh, so, uh, Jay, you, you, one of your articles in Time, you wrote about sort of the reality TV nature of this campaign. And it seems that some of the major issues, for example, um, we have a possibility of the first uh, known uh, Latino president, first woman president. We seem to be talking about a lot of other things, uh, first Jewish president. Um, one of the things we we're talking about is why Hillary Clinton isn't winning every woman's vote, particularly millennial women. So could you kind of give us a sense of that? Sure. So um, the best explanation I heard of this phenomenon was actually a 22-year-old young woman who was very articulate who I interviewed in New Hampshire who was at a Bernie rally. And um, she was the first time she was voting, and she talked about um, – how going to political events were like going on a first date. And she'd been to both Hillary rallies and to Bernie rallies, and she was going to vote for, for Bernie, and this is why, she said. And she was said that um, when you go to a Bernie rally, it's like getting swept off your feet. It's like romantic, and he'll like scream at you for 40 minutes, and you're like, yeah, scream at me for 40 more. Awesome. Revolution. Like, you know, I'm going to change the world. Free education, free health care. It's awesome. You know, and then she was like, and then you go to a Hillary rally, and it's like going on a first date with an actuary who is like talking about your mortgage payments and like saving for college and all these things that you know are really important but are really boring. And so you don't really want to like go on a date anymore with Hillary Clinton. You want to like keep dating Bernie. And that's why she ended up voting for Bernie. Um, now, when you're 22 and you know like the world is on fire, you want to see change. That like makes a lot of sense. When you're older, like you know, president actuary doesn't sound so bad, right? So, um, and I think Hillary's challenge with a lot of female millennials um, is not only inspiration, but it's also trying to explain to them. I mean, millennial generation is, and I'm at the upper cusp of the millennials. Um, it's the first generation born assuming equality of the sexes. It's one of the hallmarks of our generation. And, you know, there's an assumption amongst millennial women, of course there'll be a female president in our lifetime, but why does it have to be Hillary? And she doesn't make the case well enough. She doesn't really make, like, connect all the dots for them. She, she telegraphs in her speeches, you know, well, I went to Beijing and I spoke about, you know, women's rights as human rights. And to millennials, we're like, yeah, of course that's, you know, normal. Women's rights are human rights. And, like, they don't understand the import of that. And they don't, you know, like, I remember, you know, talking to millennials and hearing, like, they, she has these t-shirts in her campaign that show pantsuits. And they're like, what's the importance of that? And I was like, well, 
Nobody could wear pantsuits, pants to work. Women could not wear pants to work before Hillary wore pants in 1993 to the White House. Like, it just wasn't really done. And all the millennials were like, whoa, I didn't even know that. That's really cool. And like, so she doesn't, she doesn't ever like t explain for the generation that never does its homework um, why she actually would represent them better than other candidates and why she would be a good, rep you know, like how she would help women um, f further themselves. So she's being, um out hip by a 74-year-old uh, socialist. Vermont socialist, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Dan, uh, of course, the other end of it is Donald Trump, and uh, the word misogynist and other things have been thrown in his direction. And there has been an awful lot of the kind of in-your-face, raw, uh, street-level, ethnic kind of stuff that you really don't hear very much, right up on the debate stage, right, on the, right in the campaign. And, and as a result of it, many of the candidates uh, are, have quite unfavorable ratings with, with the voters. What does that mean for campaigning? Is this, is this a trend that we're now going to have to sort of out insult the next candidate? To Art's point, I mean, you know, um, I think that there's a tendency in the media with each cycle to say this is completely unprecedented and has never happened before. Um, and there are some things that Donald Trump has done in particular that have sort of been um, outside of the box. Um, and there is, a, there is a trend line in sort of uh, divisiveness along racial lines, along socioeconomic lines, even in these elections. You look at as recently as the 1980s, um, more than 85% of the electoral vote overall was white. Now that's down to 70% even. And in this election in particular, we're looking at a dynamic where you have a front runner on the Democratic side and Secretary Clinton, who has built you know, a diverse coalition of African American voters and Latinos and women and educated, uh, more affluent whites, and a candidate front runner on the right in Donald Trump, who has really done the opposite and you know, stands to probably get a, a smaller share of the non-white vote than anybody before. And it has changed campaigning in some ways, but again, it's not completely unprecedented. And I think that whether or not Trump wins even the nomination, let alone the general election, you can look to previous elections to sort of see what this means as a culture when a candidate is, is successful saying things, as you, as you pointed out, Lonnie, that um, many of us, many people in general, see as misogynistic or racist or whatever. Um, and a good example that I sort of go back to is George Wallace, who is a strident segregationist governor from the South in the 1960s, who then ran for president in 1968 and, and again afterwards, and he never even came as close to you know, winning as, as Trump did. He was a much more of a long shot. But what he did, I think, um, is sort of open the door for conservatives to speak differently about um, issues of race, about issues even of gender as well, and sort of ushered in a new generation uh, of, of Republicans who are willing to do that and able to do that very effectively with Richard Nixon, for example, is sort of a race-baiting Southern strategy. You can look at, at some of Ronald Reagan's rhetoric around race in 1980 to George Herbert Walker's you know, famous uh, Willie Horton ad in 1988. So whether or not Trump wins, there is a possibility that by embracing um, unpolitical correctness, you know, he, he has sort of created a, a space for people to do that in the future. Hmm. It's pretty frightening. So, uh, you know, I'm a a lot older and I sometimes envy people who are out on the campaign trail catching buses to, to hear the candidates say the same thing over again in a different city. I just wanted to give uh, our audience uh, a sense of what it's like to be to cover a presidential campaign right now in 2016. What are some of the things like, uh, Jay you gave some sense of it by when you talked with the young voter, but what are some of the kinds of things, and what is your, your feeling about campaigning and access to candidates and, and the whole art of trying to assess what candidates are up to? Anybody? Well, I'm old, so um, this is well. my fourth presidential campaign, and uh, it is um, very different, actually, than the, the previous three that I've covered. Um, although I only covered the beginning of the 2012 primaries, I didn't cover the, the general election. Um, but I mean, when I first started covering campaigns, uh, I, was, I did Kerry, um, John Kerry for Bloomberg News um, in 2000. I feel sorry for you. 
Actually, I loved John. <laughs> it was a great, it was a great, I was honestly, I was assigned John Kerry because it was the summer of 2003 and I was the youngest person in, uh, in Bloomberg's political room covering the campaign and everyone else got to pick first and John Kerry's uh, campaign manager and like half of his staff had just quit and everyone thought he wouldn't survive another few months in the campaign trail so it would be like good experience for me but it would be like only a few months. And then, like, lo and behold, he won Iowa, <laughs> and, and, uh, and it completely changed things. But that campaign was, I mean, I remember being, we were one bus for John Kerry. We drove all over Iowa. There was maybe a dozen reporters in the back of the bus. Kerry was in the front of the bus with Teddy Kennedy. He used to, like, narrate football games that his poor staffers were watching the Patriots back in Massachusetts, and he would give us a blow-by-blow -blow going across Iowa with his big booming voice belting it across the bus. John Kerry would play the guitar for us. I'm serious, um, and like you know, and um, and that was like a very intimate campaign. You could ask the candidate anything. You could, I mean, he was literally on the same bus with you. Um, you know that those days are long gone. Um, I mean, maybe like you know, in the beginning of this campaign, if it was if you were on the bus with Rand Paul or. I'm trying to think of, you know, Jim Gilmore, <laughs> like, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be a little bit like that, but for a front runner, you never get that anymore. I mean, they're just so walled off. They're so, uh, you know, um, hard to get to. I think Hillary hasn't actually spoken to her press corps in like five months. There's like a running tally going on. Um, you know, it's, it's really different. I mean, Bernie talks to the press a fair amount. That's, I mean, fair, to be fair. And so does Ted Cruz. Um, Donald Trump does, I mean, Donald Trump does and doesn't. It just depends on how you want to see it. Um, but it's just, I think it's a very different nature. Also, the news agencies can't afford to send us out the way we used to. I mean, we used to embed, we used to fly around with these candidates. There's, no, there's not even enough money to do campaign planes anymore virtually. I mean, I think Bernie is one that's sort of very ad hoc. Um, but uh, it used to be that, you know, back in 08, in, when I covered Obama and Hillary um, for time, you know, those, those campaign planes started way, you know, sort of in 2007, we, were ha we had planes that we flew around that we chartered with the candidates that, you know, that um, for the better part of almost two years, we were traveling with the candidates. So um, it's just then nobody can afford that anymore. So it's a very different, you know, kind of pick up candidates as you go. There's much less reporters embedding with one candidate and a lot more people kind of catching them as they come through. It's just very different. And then obviously Twitter and the, the evolution of how quick things go has changed things enormously. So how has that impacted coverage in your mind overall? It's a huge impact. I mean, the, the, I, mean I, I think everyone else should answer this too, but sure. I mean, I, you know, it's so immediate, you know, like, and, and it's so fleeting. Everything is so fleeting. It's so, um, the, 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 it's so insubstantial, frankly. Um, and like this, the stories out of this cycle are just so, I mean, like a reality TV show, frankly. Um, it's just, it's a very different feel. And, and just sort of piggybacking on that quickly, I think that the room for error for candidates is so much smaller than it used to be in the past because of, you know, social media. Um, although the press corps has contracted a little bit, there's still, you know, a lot of us out there. I was at the debate last night in Brooklyn, and I don't know, there were a couple hundred uh, mm. reporters there filling up a, a whole former warehouse. Um, and it, it just sort of it's changed things. And I think that when you're out on the trail, you, you sort of come to appreciate to a certain extent how grueling of a process and how difficult of a process it is for the candidates themselves. And it's, it's almost cliche to say, but you know, you can say, well, it's, it's easy. All they have to do is get up and give a speech and you know, but it's, but it's hard. And when you're under constant, you know, constant pressure to perform and constant pressure to not make any mistakes, you know, almost 24 hours a day and you're flying around the country and you're, you know, on a plane all day long and in hotels, it, you know, as a reporter, it gives you an appreciation for the fact that these people really do go through a crucible of sorts to, to be in this position. And one thing I also wanted to mention that, you know, I, I covered uh, some of the race, especially with Romney in 2008 as, a, as just a, a reporter, but this time as head of the news division in a polling organization, I have never seen uh, how polls affect things this year. And we see it all with the debates, right? You've never had a situation where um, the debate aggregates are actually determining where you stand on a debate stage and whether you're on the stage at all. And that is fascinating, especially because, and this is maybe sacrilegious for me to say, but polling has probably never been less accurate in 50 or 60 years than it is right now. 
Follow that up for a minute. Why is that so? Uh, because of cell phones and the internet. So basically with us, you know, we were used to getting 80% response rates at least a night with landlines. And now the fact that you know, a good 60% uh, you know, of the people are basically using cell phones as their primary mode of communication, that's making it very difficult for people, for us to reach people. We're, we have ways to do it, and there's a lot of listed people with cell phones, but it's making the a nationally representative sample harder and harder. So it, you all should be warier of the polls that you see, especially in the primary season, than you ever have been before. I mean, the thing I've been saying repeatedly is, it was probably more accurate to track the presidential race in 2004 than it is in 2016. Wow, and the polls have really been a large core of what, what the news is. I mean, I mean as, as things get less accurate, the polls seem to loom larger, which is such an irony of, of the situation. Well, Trump himself sort of trumps his own poll results. You know, Absolutely. So how does the BBC cover this madness? Well, we... We don't have campaign embeds. Um, I think that goes a lot to resources and also just... Um, it's a foreign country. It's a foreign country, <laughs> right. So they don't want to put all of their focus on the U.S. election. And there is also a debate within the BBC about how much we should be covering it. How often should we be talking about the primaries when the election's not for months or a year or, you know. Um, but so what we do is we try and find the um, key moments basically key moments and um, different campaign events and then kind of give more context to to the story like for example for the New York primary we're doing a story about um, the big sort of kind of the big fears um, of the US like we're going to a mosque and talking to an imam and kind of making the 9-11 connection and kind of putting it more <coughs> into a foreign policy and historical context for people so certainly um analysis and um, close looks at things are a way to offset the, the kinds of things that get done daily. Jay, you talked about the sort of un, unsubstantial, I think the word you used, uh, reporting that, that happens. So I guess the obligatory question is, the big criticism of the press has been in this cycle, partly because of disruption in the industry, that we tend to go for clickbait for the, the latest comment about Megyn Kelly or about uh, building a wall or about um, whatever a candidate puts out there and leads us around. What is the antidote to that? How do, you, how do you get out of that kind of coverage being substantially what the coverage is? Well, I mean, what we've been trying to do with varying levels of success is to actually cover the issues, poll on the issues that people say that they're interested in. I mean, it still sometimes veers into clickbait even on that level, but, but for the most part, you know, we're able to uh, gauge how people are feeling about taxes and trade and race relations and, and uh, where they want our foreign policy to go. I think if the media just repels a lot of the personality parts of it, obviously easier said than done, and, and focuses on what people want to hear issue-wise, that's the way I see out of that. Because there is a financial reason uh, for the fact that, that we're like this. I mean, the more clicks, the more money. Um, CNN and Fox and a bunch of other people have made a bunch of cash with these uh, town meetings and debates. And so some may say that we've become part of this whole process because of our need to survive. I mean, that's part of, I mean, the nature of news, unfortunately, is that it's a profit-making endeavor. And I think it, part of the problem is that when you need to make money out of news, you go, you end up having to go for the lowest common denominator to some degree. Certainly at time, that's a struggle. We used to, John Stewart back in the day when he was, you know, around, he used to mock us constantly for the very serious covers of international covers that we did compared to the really fluffy domestic covers that we did. I remember one, it was like Valentine's Day in 2012 or something, or maybe 2013, and when it was like the international edition was like Syria is like melting down, and then the national cover was um, 
a picture of a Great Dane and a Chihuahua, and it was, can pets be friends? Um, and it was, and that's frankly what sells, and that's, you know, um, it's hard for, it's a, t a time we struggle with it all the time. How do you, um, how do you get people to digest international news? How do you get people to digest serious news? And sometimes um, it works and sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, it, it's really hard to get, you know, every time basically you see an international cover of Time magazine in, in America, you, we are losing money on that cover essentially because we, um, it's very hard to make, to sell that cover. But we felt it was so important that America be alerted of this issue, whatever it is. Haiti earthquake was one that I worked on um, that we, went ahead and put it on the cover um, and that's you know it's 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 a struggle that we that we go through and it's um, you know and sometimes lose and sometimes win and um, and and I, it's I think it's just how do you take profit making out of news and that's an existential question that I think everybody is facing so just as an example of that um, in the debate last night the, the foreign policy section featured questions on Syria and on the Middle East, specifically the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, so most of the, the majority of the continents on, on our planet were, were ignored um, entirely. And, and that's not a knock on CNN. The NewsHour um, hosted a debate, and we struggled a lot with, with a couple months ago in Milwaukee with how to, um, how to try and broaden it out. And, it, and it's on us, but it's, but it's hard. And you know, I, I get a lot of criticism from my friends in, in the non-journalism world who say, you're part of the problem. The media gave rise to Trump. And, and I think that's something that's going to be debated for a long time to come, and it's a chicken or the egg question. But, you know, as Jay said, it is a profit-making endeavor, and people forget that that Trump uh, started leading national polls, and Art can speak to this, almost immediately after he announced his race, and with one very brief moment when Ben Carson uh, was ahead in a national poll, he has led every single national poll now for the last almost, what is it, 10 months. And so the question is, you know, if somebody is, is if people are dominating um, a race who are not speaking about substantive issues, how is the media, do we, do we move them in that direction or move coverage in that direction or is that our responsibility or is it, is it our responsibility to, to cover what it is that these people are talking about? That's I mean, an excellent question. Let's, let's I mean, this is a debate that's going to be studied in schools like this for, for years or decades probably. It's, uh, you know, I mean, to your point, it's, it's like, yeah, he, he showed up. He did well in the polls. I mean, granted, people know who he is. He has 98, 99% um, knowledge of uh, people in this country know who he is very much so, more than they, they absolutely knew about Ted Cruz going into this. Strangely, more than, a lot more than Bernie Sanders. I mean, you'd be amazed at how little Bernie was known when he, less than 50% when he entered the race, and look at how well he's doing now. Um, but it's one of those things you can look at. Did, is the media not hard enough on Donald Trump? Is the media too hard on him in certain ways? Is, do they give him too much coverage? Or do they got, give him not enough coverage because they're not actually covering his business imbroglios, his four bankruptcies, things like that? I mean, I see a, a tremendous amount of response when we do stories. Why aren't you talking about when he went under in 1990, 99, and then they, they rattle off the, the years? So that would be a case of that the media is not doing a good enough job. So it, it, it really is, is not an easy question as to whether we're part of the problem or solution. I think that we're involved in it, um, and the question is to how much extent it should be. I think, I think it's really important to put some of those moments into context, but also to talk to actual voters and hear what they think and just from speaking to supporters of all the different candidates really but especially Trump supporters when you ask them why they support him they basically just parrot back to you lines from his speeches like they'll say he's gonna bring back jobs he's gonna fix the country he's gonna make America great again they're not really paying attention necessarily to his specific foreign policy plans they say when he's president he'll hire people who will figure it out for him basically so it's not necessarily what people are voting based on anyway. I would argue that, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think the media is absolutely, you know, plays a role in this and has some culpability, but I also think a lot of this is the nature of uh, 
the modern era to some degree. It's the nature of the internet. It's the nature of disruption. And you have this electorate that is, um, especially on the right, that sees all this disruption going on in other sectors, like it's you know healthcare or um, you know how you drive your car. Your car talks to you. I mean, like uh, all the ways we do things has been changing rapidly, right? Like, um, and your smartphones. I mean, everything is changing and becoming more convenient and it's being disrupted. And as we've made these lightning kind of changes in our lives, this, this kind of impatience that the media has somewhat exacerbated with its delivery of Twitter and other sort of instantaneous gratifications that have happened, um, have made people expect change in government very rapidly. And, you know, in the, in the last three cycles, Republicans have voted in three different classes of Tea Party uh, con congressmen who have been elected on the promise that they are going to totally change Washington, disrupt Washington, um, you know, and, and all of those promises have gone unmet. And that's created an increasingly frustrated electorate, especially on the left, on, on the right, where they keep electing these people who say, we're going to repeal Obamacare, we're going to like, you know, end Dodd-Frank, we're going to do all this stuff, we're going to impeach Obama. And none of it ever gets done because you know, government is not built to move quickly. I mean, Barack Obama says it's like turning an aircraft carrier. You can only do it in sort of incremental degrees. It is a system of checks and balances that our forefathers built to specifically not move very quickly. Um, and disrupting it is almost impossible. Even if you elected Donald Trump, it's impossible to disrupt this government. I mean, the bureaucracy is not built to move quickly. Um, and I think that that has also played into a lot of the frustrations. Okay. Now, you mentioned clickbait before, and I was going to say that this is sort of a, a smaller phenomenon within the larger picture of how the media is covering the race and our impact and so on. But Bernie Sanders, as it turns out, is the ultimate clickbait. If you put Bernie Sanders in a headline, if you mention him on social media, you, you see a huge, overwhelming response that you don't see. Trump is an exception, but certainly compared to Clinton, um, that you don't necessarily see. And it's being driven by younger voters, I think, who are engaging with this process in different ways than, than people did in the past, who are processing news in different ways they did in the past, who are having conversations on social media. And you know, as Ashley said, when you're out talking to Bernie Sanders supporters or Trump supporters and you ask them why they support a particular candidate, they might not always have sort of a, a strong policy background for why, but they'll say, well, we were talking about it we, you know, on Facebook with, with my friends, or you know, he's all over Twitter. And that's driving a lot of the coverage of Bernie Sanders to a degree. I think that if, if younger people weren't as interested in him for whatever the range of reasons that they are, he would be covered less uh, in the press because his stories wouldn't do as well and, and we wouldn't feel drawn to him and to building <coughs> momentum around him. And that is a change, I think, frankly, that, that we could see play out in the future as more and more young people are you know, natives to this technology and are almost choosing the stories that they want to be interested in as opposed to being told by us what it is they should read or view. Well, since we're in a, the world's best journalism school, I'm sure that we're going to be asked questions about this from the audience. So I'm going to move on from us and look back at the campaign. So this has been a very long time. Uh, since I think the first candidates were declaring back in June or so. Earlier than that, April. Earlier than that. Hillary was April last year. Well, she declared four years ago. Um, <laughs> so what happens now? So there's all this talk, the brokered convention, Paul Ryan uh, suing Colorado for the delegates. Uh, Bernie um, says that Hillary and the, and the Democratic Party are in cahoots to boot him out. And, we're heading to the, the conventions. We have um, Bernie Sanders practically calling Hillary a racist last night. Uh, all kinds of things are happening. Let us know your best sort of look and what, what we're going to see in the next few months. Well, what I uh, have been seeing, and I've been on a couple of radio programs about this in the last week talking about it, is. Uh, I, I think that Trump is not going to get to the 1237 mark. As I said a few minutes ago, I think that there's a chance, it'll probably be between 30 and 80 delegates shy is, is what we're, we're counting at this point. And there's a big difference between 30 and 80 in this kind of case. It's, it's hard to say, I'm gonna put you over the finish line, Donald Trump, if you're 80 delegates shy. And, and there may be a lot of reason to, to do some kind of, 
um, brokering once the convention starts. But if he's 20 or 30 down in mid-June or early June and going into July, that's, I, I could see a lot of deal making happening. I mean, I've never seen anything like it where a party is literally trying to destroy itself by not nominating the person who's gotten the most votes at this point. And uh, so I, you know, looking at things historically, a 1912 scenario is very possible here where you know Teddy Roosevelt bolted the convention when he didn't get the nomination and formed the Progressive Party wound up winning wound up going in second to Woodrow Wilson but allowing the incumbent president William Howard Taft to have the worst re-election campaign I, I believe he only got eight electoral votes that year which was you know astounding that kind of scenario is is very possible at this point as, as far as we're we're seeing so uh, and on the Democratic side my prediction is that Hillary is going to you know be a first ballot nominee uh, I, I was starting to think for a while there could be some grand bargain if she didn't make it to the delegate number where she had to make some kind of deal with Bernie Sanders but that's increasingly becoming less likely anybody else want to take on that um, I, well, so uh, <clears throat> I think obviously Hillary will be the nominee on the Democratic side. There's not much question in that. Uh, on the Republican side, and I've written a lot about this at the time, I actually have a page this week on this, um, on uh, the Republican side. I think establishment Republicans in Washington, and this includes Paul Ryan, who I've spoken to about this, and others, um, are kind of waiting to see. I mean, they're, they're waiting to um, see how, where the momentum goes and how it goes. And where you are now could be very different than where you are in a month or two. Um, there's a lot of resignation to the idea that it has to be Trump or Cruz. And is all this talk of Paul Ryan is ridiculous. I mean, I think half the reason people bring up Paul Ryan is because they hate Cruz so much. They just like needling him with like the prospect of like there are other people out there. Um, but they really do hate Cruz. It's, it's sort of like, I mean, Lindsey Graham wasn't kidding when he said it's a choice between being shot and poisoned. Um, and so uh, it's, um, uh, it's, so, I mean, then there are pros and cons to both of those nominations. I mean, I think everybody in Washington assumes you'll lose a general election to Hillary Clinton with either Trump or Cruz. Just statistically speaking, it's almost impossible for them to win. Um, to give you an idea of one demographic, because I, I just wrote a book on women, um, on how hard that would be, um, a Republican presidential candidate has not won the female vote since George H.W. Bush in 1988. Now, women make up 53% of the electorate and vote 10% more than men do. So women have swung every election since Ronald Reagan. Um, the only way Republicans win uh, the, the presidency is by mitigating the loss of women to less than five percentage points to Democrats. Um, and that was done by George W. Bush twice um, and with his sort of push with security moms and soccer moms. Now, Donald Trump is underwater with women by 73 points. That's a lot of distance <laughs> to make up. Only 73. <laughs> Uh, you know, um, Ted Cruz is underwater with women by 37 points. Um, that's just, you know, so that gives you an example of one demographic, let alone Latinos, African Americans, um, the list goes on and on. So um, they basically have assumed that you're going to lose no matter which way you have uh, Trump versus Cruz. Now, um, there's losing and then there's losing, losing. Um, and I think that's the calculations that are being made right now. So if you have <laughs> Trump as your nominee, you avoid the short-term pain of splitting your party and having him walk away angrily with millions of supporters causing riots in the streets of Cleveland and, you know, just basic turmoil uh, for the entire general election, um, and, and which has, he's basically promised to do. Um, if you, but, but you, if you, you also potentially long-term do a huge amount of damage to your party because you could put off women and minorities for generations, um, especially amongst young voters who dislike Donald Trump to the tune of 80%. Um, and, uh, but if you get Ted Cruz, you have the short-term pain of splitting the party, but potentially a lot less long-term pain and the silver lining of being able to have a kind of Barry Goldwater moment with the Tea Party and kind of bridge them back in after this is all done and sort of say, well, you guys got your candidate, we ran him, he lost like 47 states and now we're going to move on. Um, so it's, you know, it's, these are the calculations that a lot of establishment Republicans have been making on the Hill in the last few months, in the last few weeks, I should say. 
and a, and a lot of whether they'll go with Trump or Cruz will depend on who has the momentum going into the camp into the into the convention. And so if Trump does kind of like a Lindsay Lohan and and peters out over the next two months, um, and like the and the number of sort of crazy followers willing to like you know lemming like go off the cliff with him after the Cleveland election you know if he's denied the, the, the nomination in Cleveland is reduced then then it's easier to deny him the nomination if he roars into Cleveland with like you know on a huge high it's a lot harder to deny him so that's like what they're trying to figure out meanwhile all the money is going to the Senate like everything is like being thrown to putting the Senate so I spoke with um, the Koch brothers you know last week and they were like and they're putting almost 900 million dollars into this campaign Almost all of it's going to the Senate. They're not even playing in the, in the presidential race. Um, they're really like uh, you talk to uh, Rince Priebus and like and a lot of the RNC guys, um, and that's why Donald Trump is so pissed. But they're basically he's he's already said, whomever the nominee is, I'm retaining control over the RNC's funds, and that is his warning to say I'm basically going to fund the Senate, and not not the presidential race. So, yeah, I mean there was also a um, I don't know if people saw it today a, a Washington Post story which said that if Hillary gets 54 percent of the not of the popular vote that they predict the house would go to the democratic party i don't know if any of you saw that but that's that's to think that's even possible that the house is in play yeah. certainly the senate is it, it is is remarkable that's what i was going to ask so the the presidential candidate is at the top of the ticket mm -hmm. and uh the i guess the strategy of the Republicans in Washington at least has been to control the legislature and to block Obama's agenda. <clears throat> so is there a possibility that we'll get a, a Democratic president and a Democratic House and Senate? A couple of months ago, even even more recently I think I would have said no. But you know as that as the post story pointed out, you know, it seems like at this point it is possible. I would say the odds are still low. Um, after the midterms, the last midterms, it seemed like the Senate map was looking very, very favorable for Democrats. If Trump wasn't the nominee, I think they would have a harder time winning back the Senate. Um, with Trump, you know, there's questions about how that's going to affect races down ballot, especially for uh, vulnerable incumbents in more moderate states like Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania, Mark Kirk in Illinois, who's the only Republican senator at this point who's called for a hearing on the Supreme Court nomination of Merrick Garland, which is sort of a lightning rod issue for, for the partisanship um, in, in Washington. But, you know, if, if there, there's a larger question of if Republicans hold on to, to, to the Senate and, and whatever happens in the House, if Hillary Clinton wins, and as Jay said, you know, the odds are at this point are, are high that, that she would win a matchup against Trump or Cruz, the question is how would she govern? And w will we move into a new era of bipartisan uh, work on major legislation? Are we looking at you know another four to eight years of very very serious gridlock? Um, and I think the odds are high that that Republican, Republicans are going to have at least one, if not both, uh, houses in Congress. And if Clinton wins, it's going to be you know legislatively a pretty ugly process for the foreseeable future. I mean, we'll go back to the 90s where we suddenly have special prosecutors and investigations and, oh, wow. you know, phony scandals that come out of nowhere. I mean, that's kind of what I'm worried about and, and wondering is going to happen if, if she's elected. Now you're talking about my career. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Monica Lewinsky and little dresses and stuff like that. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask one more question, and it's about something you've all raised, which is about money. There are, and you, uh, Jay mentioned the Koch brothers and $900 million. But of course, Citizens United and Super PACs and all of the, the kinds of spending that's going on now, um, it seems pretty much to an outsider that, that the U.S. election system is capable of being just bought by, by some individuals. Uh, is, has there been enough reporting and enough said about, about the, the sort of millions of dollars over a billion dollars that's been spent uh, by by donors who have unlimited uh, amounts to spend and its impact on long term on American politics well I mean have they really bought off this election if Donald Trump is the nominee I mean is isn't Jeb Bush an example of a 
a person who tried to buy an election that failed. I mean, I, I always find this interesting. I mean, I, I, I don't want to make light of it. I'm certainly on the legislative level, there's a tremendous problem with money in politics, but I, I'm endlessly fascinated that Bernie Sanders with his $27 per person donation and, and is raising 40 to $45 million a month on that, and Donald Trump, who you know is a bit disingenuous, not surprisingly, that he's you know completely self-funding his campaign. But compared to what Jeb Bush was doing, and compared to what Marco Rubio is doing, he's right. So, on the presidential level, I'm not seeing it so much. But I'm I, obviously, when it comes to you know the the carbon tax and 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 TPP and things like that, certainly big money is is a big deal. I would, I would add also that when you look back at Jeb Bush, um, you know, we try and find new trend lines each cycle, and, and money is an example where, where reporters you know, look very closely at that, or maybe not closely enough. But with Jeb Bush, you know, he came out and started raising money for his super PAC long before he declared. It seemed like a very smart strategy. He had the whole Bush apparatus behind him from the very beginning, the Rangers and Pioneers and so on who funded the campaigns of his brother and then even his his father, and he did a very good job of raising uh, super PAC money, raised over $100 million, his, his shock and awe uh, campaign for Right to Rise. But what he didn't do is raise money for his campaign itself. And the difference is that the campaign covers the hard costs, the cost of you know, hiring planes and, and hiring staff, and all these sort of nuts and bolts things that makes a, the, the trains run on time. And by the time that, that Jeb had declared, he had a huge imbalance in funds. He had over $100 million in Right to Rise, I think it was $11 million, right, in his campaign, and then started running out of money. Uh, and then stories started coming out about how he had to cut staff and shake things up. And those are the kinds of stories that, that really blunt a candidate's momentum. And, and I think it showed, among other things, that you, know, you still need to do traditional fundraising to win. And while in the primaries, you know, we're seeing all sorts of new paradigms come out with the way the money is, is raised and spent, I think, in the general election, you know, this is a massive endeavor where 120, 130 million people are going to vote. It costs a lot of money to get out the vote. And we're going to see, I think, sort of a, a return to, to looking at sort of more traditional fundraising um, to get, you know, the two people over the top. Yeah, That's I think also vote. if there's almost bound to be a court case that comes out of this election. I mean, and I think if we remember Carly Fiorina for anything, it will be like Fiorina versus somebody. Like, I mean, like she will get, I mean, I've never seen anyone break so many campaign finance laws. It was kind of amazing. Her super PAC funded her entire campaign, like on the nuts and bolts ground. I mean, and every, every event that you went to for Carly Fiorina, people were like, and here's the super PAC passing around the hat. Can you please pay for the venue that we are in right now? You know, and like, um, it was just, you know, it was, I mean, there was, there was a lot of egregious campaign, uh, you know, campaign finance right, um, violations that happened in this primary that we're going to, I think, be talking about a lot after the election. <laughs> All right, so let's open it up to the audience. Uh, why don't you line up if you have questions of our panelists. Please uh, keep them in the form of a question and not a political statement or support or endorsement of any candidate. We, we, we endorse no one in this campaign. Yes, ma'am. can't do this. <laughs> a question for Jay. Um, you mentioned that um, about how poor the Republican numbers are for, for women. And um, I'm just curious. I, I personally don't see Republican women voting for Hillary Clinton. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, do you think they won't <laughs> vote? No, I mean, so I, yeah, a lot of them just won't turn out. Um, they just won't vote at all. Um, the Republican women that I've spoken to, I spoke, you know, um, at a Republic, I had, I've been promoting this a book that I just wrote called Broad Influence, How Women Are Changing the Way America Works, and I have a whole chapter on Republican women in it, and so I was speaking to a luncheon on Republican women. I actually asked the room of about 100 women how many, you know, if it was Trump versus Hillary, how many would vote for Trump, and about five people raised their hands. And I said, how many would not vote? And um, maybe about 20 people raised their hands. And I said, how many people would vote for Hillary? And about 60 people raised their hands. So you'd be surprised. Um, I mean, but this was also, I mean, 
very inside the Beltway group, right? Um, but, I mean, Laura Bush basically said last week that she would vote for Hillary. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty stunning. Um, like, inside the Bush world, um, inside the establishment, how um, especially, I mean, Republican women are just appalled at the idea of a Trump hmm. nomination. You had um, Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's the top Republican in the House a few weeks ago, give, you know, basically representing all 23 female members of the, the House, um, women, saying we do not support Trump, he does not represent what we stand for, um, you know, and that's pretty unprecedented. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, most Republican women, you talk to them, they're just appalled. So um, it's, it's very striking, and it's like almost a revolution on its own. And you can count Thank my you. mother, who's a Republican woman, who said to me that she will vote for Hillary Clinton. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hi there, uh, Max Toomey, I'm a current student here. We talked a little bit about the house races and I'm kind of looking at the places that are toss-ups at the moment, the kind of like upstate New York, uh, Pennsylvania. They're places where politics is kind of very much in the middle, kind of moderates presenting, trying to win Democrats over or vice versa. And I'm kind of curious how you see the presidential election and the debate that's gonna go over at the top affecting those races where there are kind of, it's a, it's a moderate debate where there's an extreme at the top. Um, I, I, you know, it, it's totally a case by case basis or a district by district kind of situation. In, in places where Democrats, I'm sorry, Republicans would be a little more vulnerable perhaps in, in more blue states like California and, and the few that are remaining in New York and uh, in, in places like, you know, Florida is an interesting one because that is such a split down the middle kind of place. We definitely have evidence that those candidate, those Republican candidates are doing everything they can to not only distance themselves from Trump, but to actually, if, if it behooves them to align themselves with Obama and whoever the Democrat is in, you know, in, in, in so many words type of thing. I, I don't see on our polling the opposite happening where Democrats are really afraid of aligning themselves with Hillary. I mean, one thing, you know, President Obama has been at the highest approval rating he's been at for since February of 2013. In our daily tracking he, last week, he was at 53%, which, you know, is, is in the middle. At this time in his presidency, President Reagan was at 50%, and President Clinton was at 56%. So for those who think Obama is out, and Clinton and Reagan both had scandals that they were emerging from or a part of at that time in their presidency. So Obama doesn't have a scandal. He is definitely going to be out on the trail and he is definitely going to be doing campaigning that's probably going to help Democrats on the, the House and Senate if I, levels. Oh, well, I was just going to jump in and say that, um, you know, the, ho the House Democrats right now have the largest, are looking at the largest minority, have the largest minority since, I think, 1928. It's about 60 or so seats. Um, down ballot races are definitely obviously going to be affected by, by Trump, especially if he's the nominee, but it would have to be a huge, huge lift on the part of the Democratic Party in order to make up that deficit. Yes, they could pick up a couple dozen House seats, but you know, getting all the way back to the six or so they need is still, is still a long shot. And I would also add that you know, in all this, we shouldn't underestimate the amount of support for Trump among conservative voters. And through earlier this, or I, I should say mid-March, I was looking at, at turnout numbers, and after, through Arizona and Idaho and Utah, Republican turnout in the primaries was up 58% compared to that point in 2012. And we were seeing huge gains in states around the country. I mean, in Texas, it went from 1.4 million voters in the 2012 primary to 2.8 this year. Obviously, some of that was impacted by having a home state center and Ted Cruz running, but we saw that in Virginia. We saw that in smaller states like Maine. So there are a lot, a lot of people turning out, um, and, and that, you know, suggests that we could see, so could see Republicans hold on to some of those sort of more moderate districts. I was just going to say, so, so um, it's actually a 30-seat majority. Democrats would need to win 30 seats in order to win back the House, out of which um, about 14 to 17 are currently in play. Um, we, so yes, they could, I think, fairly, and the problem is, is that 
these seats are all incredibly gerrymandered. I mean, like, there's almost all of them are very safe, and that's, you know, and, and frankly, in control by Republicans because Republicans swept 2010, and that was a census year, and they were the ones who basically did all the redrawing of the districts, and it's made their majority incredibly difficult to overcome until we go through another census in 2020. Um, and so uh, they, but if you do have a wave, you know, that the last sort of, you know, the last sort of 13 seats from the 17 swing that you have right now, like in a very optimistic year for Democrats, are, you know, could become feasible, you know, in, in sort of lean Republican districts. Now, the way that happens, though, is um, you need candidate recruitment. And so the DCCC has, and, and Emily's List, has spent the last three or four weeks sort of frantically kind of going back over their candidate recruitment, trying to get more people to run, trying to get more people to get in the race. You saw, um, and that's happened in the Senate. You've seen it a little bit, like uh, Patty Judge running in Iowa against Chuck Grassley on the Senate side. Um, you've seen a lot more candidates starting to come into the races, but one of the... Uh, NRCC's top aides, uh, which is the National Republican Campaign Committee, which helps elect Republicans to Congress, told me that they're actually really just counting their lucky stars that Democrats realize this really late um, and that they are not in such a great position in terms of candidate recruitment to take advantage of, of whatever potential wave is happening. Right. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Diana Golden, class of 66. This is my 50th reunion, so I've seen an awful lot of presidential elections. <laughs> this one takes a cake, it really does. Um, my question to you is, I, I understand that women have um, a great deal at stake in uh, this election, and I think they're, they're going to come out in droves, whichever way they go. Uh, but the millennials, are, with all the excitement about digital media, uh, you still can't vote that way. Do you think they're going to come out in very large numbers, larger numbers than they have in the past? Um, well, it's true, Hillary, you know, as um, Dan was saying earlier, Hillary doesn't draw a lot of the millennial vote. She's not very popular with um, with uh, voters. I mean, Bernie Sanders is much more their, their interest. Um, but. All of Hillary's enthusiasm gaps are almost completely made up at, by Donald Trump's <laughs> candidacy. So it's like people are much more enthusiastic about voting against him than they are really for her. So um, that's like her silver lining here is that I think most millennials um, would end up voting for her because they just are appalled by him. Um, but it's, I mean, it's true. She, she's, she has not done a good job talking to millennials. She acknowledges that herself. She's, you know, she's got a lot of issues with them, as we said in the beginning. Um, and, and trying to sort of find that passion is, is, has been a challenge for her. Um, I, think, I think that if it's Hillary versus Trump, I've talked to a lot of people who said that they are just not going to vote. A lot of Bernie supporters um, and others who said that they just won't vote in that situation. So I think you might have a case where there is a low turnout of millennials if that's the situation. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at likely voter models, and I echo what Jay and Ashley have said. I mean, there's just it, it, what you're, a lot of people on in the Clinton camp have falsely, in my opinion, assumed that the Obama voters en masse are going to go for Hillary. I mean, that's just not going to happen. I mean, what you're going to see is that Barack Obama was a once in a perhaps lifetime kind of president and candidate because of what he, how he was able to draw from so many different uh, <coughs> sectors. And, you know, people forget John Kerry was supposed to be drawing out the millennial, well, I don't know if they were called millennials in 2004, but <laughs> the youth vote in, 20, in 2004, and that just didn't happen. So, and if it had happened, we would have had a President Kerry. So I, I, those who think that Hillary can count on the millennial vote do so, I think, at their own peril. Thank you. Hello there. Um, I apologize for being a little bit sensational, but I... I know some people worry that something could happen to the Hillary campaign that we can't foresee at this point. Um, you know, is there some, is it foreseeable that she could have a mistake of, of enough magnitude, a scandal of enough magnitude that it, it ushers in Trump or Cruz and then what does that look like in terms of politics? Go ahead. Well, I mean, clearly there's the email FBI issue. Um, it seems like she, you know, at this point would not 
it's not likely that she would be indicted if she was. That would maybe rise to that magnitude. But when we look at scandals, when we look at sort of big gaffes, um, I think that there's an over-reliance on thinking about them as being influential and really shaping elections. And what sort of increasingly um, sophisticated political science studies are showing is that by the time you get to a general election, the things that really move voters are pretty fundamental and have less to do even with the personalities of the candidates or things that they might say, but you know where the economy is, second quarter, third quarter GDP growth, where the sitting president's approval numbers are, those are the kinds of things that ultimately sway voters. And 2012 was a good example where Romney had his 47% gaffe video and, and the press made a huge, huge deal of it. And it was instructive in, in sort of giving a window into maybe the way that, that you know, Romney thinks about some tax issues and about the way that, you know, uh, individuals, the responsibilities they have in society. But in all the, the studies that came out after that showed that even something like that, which was a pretty egregious um, misspeak, ultimately didn't have an impact on the way that people voted. So at this point, you know, you would have to be talking about a huge, huge, huge monumental mistake on Clinton's part, and it's hard to see that happening. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I, I actually think, I've come to the belief that if she gets indicted, it will only embolden her, and she may actually go up in popularity because, you know, she could say it's a partisan witch hunt, the vast right-wing conspiracy, you know, you name it. I mean, don't forget, in 1920, Eugene Debs got nearly a million votes from a federal prison, so just to put that out there. Free Hillary, I suppose. <laughs> uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Emily. I cover politics in the Netherlands, where I'm from, and we currently have 16 parties in a 150-seat house oh. because, because of the whole coalition system that we have and then people splitting or being forced out of their party. Um, so we're really interested in, is this going to be the end of the two-party system in the United States? Will this split the Republican Party? Hmm. I, you know, I said earlier, I, I think very possibly. I mean, I, I would almost go into the probable category for this cycle because you know Trump's not going away and he will I mean the question is can he get on all 50 states if he wants to run as an independent Ross Perot did so as late as July of 92 so uh, if he's not the nominee I think you can bet on that he's going to be a third party candidate the question is is this like 1912 where Teddy Roosevelt ran and it was a one-shot deal and you never had a progressive party again and it just went back to the two-party system after that. I, there's no evidence to say either way really, but the idea that this could be a permanent movement based on everything that Trump has been dredging up in the American psyche is very possible. I mean, that what's you going to happen- populist, populist parties all over Europe now that are new to the system. So I'm wondering if there is room for that here. That I, I think so. I mean, you can't put the, the, the genie back in the bottle necessarily after this. I mean, look at all of the issues, and not even just on the Republican side. Look at all the issues that have been raised on the Democratic side with income inequality and, and, and too big to fail and, and things of that nature. Um, I don't think Bernie would run as a third party candidate, but, but certainly that momentum, that, that, that spirit, is not going to go away in, on January 20th, 2017, and it's up to whoever is supporting them. We could potentially have a three or four party system in this country in, in years to come. I used to play devil's advocate. I would say I, I wouldn't, I don't think so. I mean, I think if we do have a third party candidacy with Donald Trump this time, which is very li likely, I don't think it lasts. Um, our system is massive. Um, it is built in a two-party system. It is invested in with billions of dollars uh, throughout all 50 states, um, trying to recreate something uh, or something new that would like challenge those systems, would take a grassroots sustained revolution, like to quote Bernie Sanders, um, that would have to really be sustained, I mean, for years on end. And Americans, are so like their their attention span is like of a gnat i mean like they just don't they're like i mean they're, it'll, be, it'll be like it's here and gone you know like i just can't imagine that anything that gets started now is going to last through the next few cycles and yeah the tea party has lasted a few cycles but um it's not anywhere near organizationally speaking on the grassroots level um and the state levels state party levels uh, where it needs to be in order to begin to revolutionize our system and i just don't 
it's a very hard, I mean, our system is just so entrenched and so, um, there's so much money and so much power that is there in, the, in, in those two parties, not just in Washington, but in the state levels. It's very difficult to uproot that. I, I wanted to ask a follow, oh, go ahead, Dan, I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna add very quickly that I, I agree with Jay, and I think that all this talk about conventions and, and delegates and so on has given us sort of a peek under the hood of the system in a way that we haven't had in a while. And what it's shown is that the parties hold a very, very, very tight grip on the nomination process, among other things. So, you know, it's hard with the superdelegates on the Democratic side and with the way that delegates to the National Convention are elected on the Republican side on a state-by-state -state level. It's very hard for a third-party candidate to gain any kind of traction. The follow-up question I was going to ask is that the, the Trump constituency and, and Bernie Sanders constituency in particular seem uh, fairly active, angry, organized, uh, permanent. What happens to their movements if either of them or both of them lose, which seems likely? What, what happens to that, that sort of discontent? Well, I mean, I guess the question is, do they remain an organized movement or does the spirit become imbued in lots of candidates. You know, does this actually turn into a party or does this turn into some kind of multi-tentacled movement that just becomes part of how Democrats are in the future? I mean, yeah, there may not be a third party situation in the future, but, but what Bernie could be doing for the Democrats is fundamentally reshaping the party for a generation. And, and that, I'm sure he would consider that a success. I mean, it's the Tea Party. It's very hard to create um, opposition in governance. Um, so the Tea Party didn't come to full fruition until President Bush was out of the White House and, and a Democrat was in the White House, and then the Tea Party fully burst into full life, right? Because they were they had something to, to go against, a, a figurehead to, to move against. Even though they were very unhappy at the end of the Bush administration, they weren't organized and, and as vocal until they could become in opposition. I think if you got a President Trump, I, absolutely Bernie's movement would become huge. <laughs> like it would be on steroids, it would be enormous. Like the entire left would freak out. Um, like I. <laughs> But I think if you have a President Clinton, um, opposition and governance is, is always very difficult with the majority party. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Um, hi, Jane West, class of 86, yay. Um, <laughs> uh, first career journalist, second career psychologist. So the psychologist in me is still, I'm from New York. I grew up with Trump as a name in the real estate field here. I knew him to kind of be a Democrat or I wasn't really sure, but that's really my question is, when you scrape everything away, having read Bob Woodward's interview where he, Trump you know, said right out there, I'm just doing whatever it takes to win. Hmm. So I'm wondering who at this point this man really is. And maybe you have some theories about that, that's one question. Like, what is it that he really values beyond himself? Is there another value? Um, <laughs> and then the other question is about President Obama and being such a master strategic campaigner. Is he fighting an urge or is his group involved with Hillary in any way that you might know about? Hmm. Well, that's a good one. Well, good the question. first question was definitely a psychologist journalist question. So. I, I, I'll just add, I mean, I think he will, he's doing whatever it takes to win and he believes in himself and becoming president and that's about it at this point. Uh, as far as what I'm able to see, I mean, I agree with you. I, I grew up in New York as well and, you know, I, I always saw him on the liberal side. I used to work for um, the lieutenant governor of New York in, in the 90s and, and I met him on occasion and he was definitely leaning left at that point. But the thing that he always prided himself on, and he says this, of course, to this day, is that I give to both sides. You know, I'm, I'm a businessman, and I, I want to ensure that I'm with a winner, so I'll give to both candidates. Um, you know, I've, I've wondered if this is a, if he's just turning into like kind of a crazy old man type of thing where he's, you know, getting old in age and he's starting to become the, you know, not on my lawn kind of conservative type, or is it just that I think he honestly has a very good sense of his constituency and what they want to hear implicitly and says what 
he thinks he needs to hear. I mean, look at the way he handled that abortion situation where he was, you could see he was, when he was talking to Chris Matthews, he was calculating in his mind, what do I actually say now to get the best bang for my response? And he failed, he made a mistake, he made a huge mistake at what he said. But it was, I don't even think it was because he believed anything he was saying at that moment. It was just by saying women should be punished, he thought, well, if I push that button, that's gonna get me a, a, the, the response that's been working for me before. And I think that to me is emblematic of who he is as a person. So, so he doesn't believe in anything or? think he believes in wanting to be president. Yeah. I, I, I think that it's fair at this point to, to look at him as sort of a, a classic New York Republican in the sense that, um, you know, if you scrape, it's not what he's saying on the campaign, but his past record shows that he's fairly fiscally conservative, nowhere near uh, as far right as, as some of the Republicans in the House and the Senate, um, and fairly socially liberal. Um, and I would also add that, that you know, as Trump started to rise and people started to, to question how it was that he was able to do that without any prior political experience, it's certainly true that he's never run for office, although he flirted with it as far back as the 80s. However, being a real estate developer in New York City is the essence of being a politician, and that's lost sometimes when we think about Trump. You know, when you're building buildings, um, you know, when you're doing all sorts of projects, that requires making donations to everybody on both sides of the aisle it requires convincing the city council and the, gover the, the state government in Albany to pass zoning laws to, to eminent domain property and so on. And when you do that for 40 years, you become a very shrewd operator of the way that our politics works. And, he, and he's you know, shown to be able to take those talents to a national stage. Um, I have no special insight into Donald Trump's psyche, nor is that a knowledge to which I aspire. Um, <laughs> but I will answer your, the second part of your question, which is uh, Barack Obama and the campaign. Um, all of my sources in the White House say that he is relishing the idea of going out and campaigning against Donald Trump. He's like mm. super excited about that. <laughs> like he's like like really like gunning for it. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting when he gets unleashed um, and to see what he says in the campaign trail. And it's funny because I mean, I actually um, was the judge of a bet between two other political reporters uh, last year, where one bet the other um, that. Uh, Barack Obama would be like kryptonite in the campaign trail. Nobody would want him out there with him, with them, like sort of, a la Bill Clinton in in ninety, in, you know, at the end of his candidacy, um, at the end of his presidency in two thousand, and uh, and that bet was long ago lost because it's clear that Obama will be um, a great asset to most likely Hillary Clinton. I'm Patty, class of ninety. My question is about coverage. What do y'all think um, about the coverage of the campaign, and who's doing the best job and who's doing the worst job? Okay. They're all doing the best job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take that one? I mean, I, international I, person should take it. You're yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a, you, you, you take that. I, I don't want to say who's done the worst job. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just think it's it's really interesting from my perspective to see the difference between the U.S. media coverage of the campaign, which is 24/7, people analyzing kind of every little sound bite, every. Um, every word that's said, every debate, every misstep or positive step, and it's going on in endless cycles over and over and over again. And then the way we kind of do it is to try and take a step back from that a little bit and kind of analyze more what's happening in the bigger picture and put it into a little bit more context. And we have the luxury to do that because we don't have to be covering it constantly and we don't have to be um, on top of every little detail. Mm. I mean, it's not a completely original thing to say that the Trump coverage has been rather disturbing. Um, you know, when the, you have reports coming out that the media has given him $1.9 billion in earned media, uh, pretty much, for the, the campaign. And when you have him on press conferences covered completely, meaning if he gives a press conference for 60 minutes, CNN will go live for all 60 of those minutes. I mean, that that to me personally is is disturbing and, and problematic, especially when it's giving short shrift to other candidates. And uh, I, I think that that's, that's a, and, and lastly I'll say about that is, is 
I've never seen where a major candidate can call into shows like he does, as opposed to being in person or in a satellite studio. And that that is, to me, very uh, symptomatic of, of how people, the media, us, have gone overboard in, in covering that particular campaign. Well, with the, um, the MSNBC host to where quoted offline as saying very favorable things about Trump and their relationship with him. Um, he seems a bit cozy with a lot of reporters. Uh, perhaps that's because of his previous career. Um, is, that, is that an accurate statement that Trump has been sort of endearing himself to reporters and, and getting criticized less? I don't know. Ask Megyn Kelly. I, I wouldn't. That that seems. I would. I'm surprised to even think about that because I think that he a lot of he seems to hate a lot of the media and a lot of the media <laughs> seems to hate him, but covers him anyway. Yeah, I would say it's hard to feel that Trump is endearing himself to to us when you're at a campaign rally and you know he tells his five thousand supporters, you know, look at the back of the room. You know, they're the media. They're the problem, and it's obviously part of his shtick. Um, and People on both sides of the aisle have been using the media as a foil for a, a long time. This isn't new. Boy, that's original, yeah. But um, <laughs> but Trump is, has has sort of um, ratcheted up the rhetoric. You know, he's he's gone after per reporters personally from the stump. He's he's talked about us more generally as well, um, and that creates, I think, a, an animosity among supporters towards towards <coughs> the media, which which you see and, and I think you feel. Um, when you're at his events, so I don't, I don't think that, I don't think we have a very cozy relationship. But he obviously, you know, he writes himself. He's a great story, and so from that sense, you know, it's 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 easy to be drawn to him. Well, the reason I ask that question is because that seems to be a perception that somehow Trump is getting treated more favorably than other people, and it just it's hard to, from inside, it's hard to see that. But is he getting tr treated more favorably or just treated more? You know, because yeah. when Les Moonves says this is, uh, I, I'm paraphrasing, but like kind of the golden goose and thank God for Donald Trump because he, our ratings have gone up so much. That doesn't necessarily mean he likes him. It's just he likes the profits that they're making. He knows what to say and when to dominate the media cycle. If people aren't talking about him enough, he'll say something else to grab headlines. Sure. He has the, the shock of the day philosophy. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, my name is Elsa Butler. I graduated in 08, and actually my question is somewhat of a follow-up to this discussion. Um, I wanted to um, bring up that Nicholas Kristof mea culpa piece in which he, um, you know, addressed people's concern that, okay, the, is the media um, complicit in empowering Trump? And he broke it down um, into three parts, one, that um, the media treated him as a joke too, um, too long and from the beginning, and that they handed, television handed over their air to him without ev ever really doing any um, detailed background checks, and also that the media hasn't been reporting on um, the pain of uh, working class Americans. So I wondered what your perspective of that piece was, if you uh, caught it, and is he off base? Is it more nuanced than that? Um, so That's a good question. carry on. Well, I, I mean, it, it's very interesting about the working class. I mean, I, I've been really, I mean, we've been really doing, trying to do a lot of polling this year, especially on that demographic, you know, breaking, I mean, we're, we poll a thousand people a night, every night, and uh, so we're able to really get granular with, you know, income levels and, and areas of the country and, and whatnot. And so, I mean, what's interesting about this race, right, is that at least you're hearing somewhat about those those concerns um, from both sides, certainly. Um, but but as to whether, you know, the, the actual issues are being covered as well as, as it should be, I don't personally think that that's, that's yet happening. So I have not read the piece, but that part of it, when in your question really struck me, is that I think that we could, the media could do a better job about that. 
I was on a, on a panel in New Hampshire before the primary with Chuck Todd who talked about how we were snobs um, and we totally didn't take Donald Trump seriously for far too long and I agree with that. Um, I think a lot of us just didn't take it seriously. We didn't see the power of the movement behind him and more importantly we didn't see the, the fragmentation of the establishment and their inability to stop him. Um, and so I mean part of Donald Trump's rise is, is, in, is, is in fact the weakness of the establishment in the sense that if they'd ever just actually gotten their act together and backed one particular candidate, and he's never gotten more than 50% of the vote in any state, they could have stopped him. But they, their egos and, you know, and it got too much in the way and they couldn't stop themselves and, and they couldn't rally behind one person. And so you've ended up with still to, to this day a fragmented field against Donald Trump, which ends up handicapping them. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we took it as entertainment. We took it as a joke for far too long. And, um, and in the business of entertainment news, where ratings, that really helps ratings, cable TV made a lot of money out of that. But um, in, the, uh, in the end, it, it is very serious. And, and it's something that, um, that you know, I think, uh, that's why you see the establishment so kind of, in, in the Republican side, so freaked out now about it, the permanent damage this might do the party. Okay, so we have only a few more minutes, so I'm going to give the panelists a chance to answer one more question, which is sort of another future look. So what can we do to do better, given the circumstances, given everything that's happened in covering politics and covering this election? What are some of the things that, if you could change our entire industry, that you would change right now? You have time to think about it. <laughs> and I won't call your bosses with your list. <laughs> I mean, one obvious thing that, that jumps out is it would be nice if, as an industry, we put more of a premium on stepping back more consistently and saying, why does this matter? Not just who is going to win, and that's important, and the horse race needs to be covered, but what does winning mean? And if somebody becomes a nominee who is um, such a divisive figure, what does that say about where we are as a culture, or whatever the broader questions are? And uh, we don't do that enough, and, and we're hamstrung by all sorts of resource issues and time constraints and the 24-hour news cycle and so on. But if you could wave a magic wand, um, I think everybody would be better served by having a little bit more space to, to think, think along those lines. Anybody else want to talk about that? You know, not, not taking the bait so much, I guess is the way I look at it. I mean, it was, it was so interesting with Bernie Sanders coming out of Wisconsin, winning that primary, but yet somehow the Clinton camp, you know, planted or leaked or just made a big deal about stories that of Bernie making that pronouncement that Hillary was not qualified to be president. And so suddenly that became a two or three day story based on one statement that was somewhat taken out of context and and it's in reaction reaction to something she had said previously which is that he's not qualified to be president so yeah. there seems to be kind of a, a a picking and choosing with things at times that I, I i and i can name lots of different examples but always just why do things dominate the news cycle for for certain days and other ones don't i think there needs to be a little bit better editorial judgment on that I guess I would just quibble with, with that. I mean, in the sense that uh, I think as somebody who's written a lot about women in politics, there is a huge, I mean, first of all, it wasn't her, it wasn't Hillary that said he was unqualified. It was surrogates in the campaign, which, um, and, and I guess you, it is a double standard to some degree um, that, uh, that, that Clinton surrogates could say that Bernie is unqualified, but it is very sensitive to say that Hillary is unqualified, but that's because there's a huge history of calling female candidates unqualified and, and having them prove their qualifications. And Bernie's been running against a female candidate for the better part of a year now, and he knows those pitfalls. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a huge, which is why you see every Republican candidate out there saying very distinctly, she's disqualified herself with some of her judgment decisions um, from being the nominee, which is a very different term than saying unqualified, which means her resume as a whole is unqualified to be president. Right, so there's a very big distinction between that, and I actually think it's a good thing in this cycle that you know 
know, as a woman, as like somebody who wants to see more women run and see and 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 have female candidates, that you would have those distinctions drawn because there's a very long, very complicated history with those words. And I think Bernie sometimes is very insensitive and doesn't know the history of, say, Black Lives Matter or you know, um, and gender histories and things like that. And he can, these are traps that he falls into a little too easily and he should be better prepared for. Hmm. That's very interesting. Anybody else want to tackle on that? Um, so uh, I think we've come to the end. And I thank you all for taking time out on such a beautiful day to talk about politics. I wanted to thank again our panelists uh, right here. We have our, I've got to get everybody's last name, I'm sorry. Of Art Swift, 05, was managing editor of Gallup. Ashley Simler was producer at uh, BBC, class of 11. And Jay, Jay Newton Small, is a Washington correspondent for Time, uh, and she's class of 01. And get her book, Broad Influence How Women Are Changing the Way America Works. And we have Daniel Bush, 13, who is politics producer for PBS. Thanks very much for attending. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so hey, much. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Oh. Nice to meet you, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, no. <laughs> we ended six minutes early. Oh, okay. Up there, good. Yeah.